Member of NFIB, you've unlocked the opportunity to make your voice heard in your state and in Washington, D.C. We connect you with a dedicated state director to listen to your needs, connect you with your state legislators, and directly advocate for issues that most impact your small business. Each year, our members receive a state ballot to provide input into your state's small business issues. NFIB's one member, one vote policy ensures that each of our members has equal input into their state's legislative priorities. Our resources like state voting records help our members hold legislators accountable for supporting small business. We provide information on pending small business issues and NFIB victories through our e-newsletters and NFIB.com. For over 75 years, NFIB has stood as the most prominent small business association. Whether you're in a small state or a large one, the presence of NFIB is undeniable through our membership count, our ability to impact legislative votes, and the engagement of NFIB members like you. Welcome everybody. I'm Matt Everson, uh, State Director here in Iowa for NFIB, and uh, we're excited to bring you uh, the third annual Small Business and Tax Day Luncheon. Uh, as you can see, we've uh, created a virtual studio and we're gonna be bringing uh, some of the top legislators in to uh, talk about the issues important to you all. We've gotten some pre-questions uh, from you and uh, we encourage you to type some up as this program goes along and we'll try to get those answered. Um, it's just an honor again to partner with uh, ITR. You know, they're the voice of the taxpayer. We're the voice of small business. And uh, together we're a powerful duo up here uh, at the state capitol. And it's just, it's great to partner with such an excellent group. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward hopefully to next year getting this thing live and in person again where uh, you're mixing and mingling with your legislators at uh, the luncheon and telling them, you know, what's, what's on your mind. We've got a great program today. Uh, we've, we're going to hear from some legislators, like I said, from our Iowa Capitol, and so a couple messages from uh, some of our newbies uh, in Washington, D.C., to get their perspective on their first couple months uh, up there and what they're working on. But uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, Chris, the president of uh, ITR. Thanks, Matt. As he said, I'm Chris Ingstad, president of Iowans for Tax Relief, and we're excited to be here, too, uh, with our friends and allies at NFIB. Now, we all know the government takes too much of your money and your time. Iowans deserve lower taxes, less spending, and fewer regulations. We've been proud to serve as the voice of the taxpayer for over 40 years. In addition to our work at the Capitol and around the state, we can help you join the fight too. If you're not already a member, go to joinitr.org. And if you are already a member, we thank you and invite you to ask your friends to join us. ITR lets you know who to contact, what to say, and when to do it. Together, we can speak up and ensure taxpayers quit quietly paying government's bills, so politicians will get out of our pockets and off our backs. This year, we've been working on licensing reforms to make it easier for people to work in the careers of their choice, income tax cuts so families and businesses can keep more of their hard-earned money, and we've also been working to abolish the inheritance tax, which has all sorts of detrimental impacts on farms and small businesses. Take a look at what it might do to Joe and the business that's been in his family for generations. My wife and I have some hard decisions to make. As a small business owner, my family has spent plenty of sweat and personal capital in this business that we started almost a century ago. We would like to see our business long outlive us. We don't have kids, and almost anyone that we would pass the business to would get hit with a big 10 to 15 percent tax. This would threaten our family business's future. Suppose your uncle left you a business like this and you had this huge tax bill. What kind of decisions would you have to make? Is it time for an auction? Is it time to shut down and everybody loses their job? What kind of difficult decisions would persons taking over the business be forced into making? I think that someone that would inherit a, a business like this would have a much better chance of success if they didn't have a huge tax bill to take care of up front. Why is Iowa one of the only six states out of 50 that has an inheritance tax? 
Iowa's policymakers should do everything they can to make Iowa more competitive with other states. As we come out of this recession, don't you think that Iowa policymakers should be trying to help small business instead of trying to burden them with additional taxes? It's time to do away with this nonsense tax. Now is the time to stand up for small business and contact your legislator and have them repeal the Iowa inheritance tax. What a powerful video uh, that was uh, and a huge topic for uh, both of our members, obviously. Uh, you know, we're in the virtual studio and uh, we've got an awesome special guest with us today, uh, Representative uh, Jane Bloomingdale, CPA, NFIB member, which is awesome, a long time NFIB member. And so we're really grateful uh, for you being here with us today during these uh, unreal times in a virtual manner, but we know we've got a lot of folks out there uh, watching and listening. So uh, why don't we just start? Easy one. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your district, and uh, maybe a couple of the committees you sit on. Okay. Um, well, in my real life, my other life, I am an accountant. I am not a CPA. We'll have to yeah. correct you. But um, I do a lot of income tax work, which I've been doing all weekend. Uh, my district is all along the Minnesota border from Worth County to Winnesheet, basically Lake Mills to Decorah. Um, a lot of small towns. Um, it's a great district, very um, friendly. A lot of three, 4,000 um, cities that are, you know, they have wonderful small businesses, mom and pop businesses, the type of businesses that we're talking about today. So, um, now, we all just heard from Joe. Cities. We all just heard from Joe and how the inheritance tax uh, is probably going to impact his business uh, at some point. Now, you've got another family uh, that was hit hard by the inheritance tax. Could you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, I have. I have a niece that, that died recently, and unfortunately, her parents died a few years before her, uh, left her, she and her sisters, a farm. Her grandma died a year before her and left them another farm. So the four girls had a farm or a couple farms that they own together. When my niece died, she was single, no children, and as I said, no grandparents and no parents. So she left her farms to her sisters. In Iowa, the inheritance tax you pay when you leave something to your sister versus a child or a spouse is ridiculous. On a 160-acre farm, you're gonna pay $160,000 in tax. They only make thirty or thirty-five thousand a year. You can't pay it off. Um, my nieces, my other three, were unfortunately, it was um, just a lot of money. They had to go and borrow to pay this off, and were barely able to keep the farm and their family. And what is so ridiculous that is, my niece's grandmother would have outlived her. Literally, talking six months, there would have been no tax. And because they died in that order, um, the tax was you know about one hundred fifty or sixty thousand dollars. I think we need to do something about this. It's simply fairness. It's not fair that I can leave a farm to a child, but I can't leave it to a sister, or a brother, or a niece, or or anyone. Um, I just I don't think it's a, it's simply a fairness issue for me. Um, yes, yeah, as, as you point out, uh, a lot of farms and a lot of small businesses. The, the margins in those businesses year to year mm -hmm. uh, can't, affo can't afford an additional big tax bill. Yeah. And so again, it leads to some tough decisions. We either figure out a way to pay that bill or we're forced to sell it off. And maybe it's a multiple uh, generation family business, multiple generation farming. Some of the things that are literally the backbone of Iowa are negatively impacted by this. So since this is an issue that's so important to ITR members and NFIB members, and even to you personally, what are some reforms in inheritance tax that you or your house colleagues are considering this year? Um, there's uh, two or three bills out there right now. I think there's one to completely eliminate it, which I don't think would be able to pass the House or the Senate. Um, the bill that I've introduced with a couple of my colleagues is to phase it out. Uh, right now we have a $25,000 threshold. We don't even have an exemption. So what I'd like to do in this bill is go to a $300,000 exemption, then a $600,000 exemption, then a million dollar exemption, and then phase it out completely. Um, you know, it's about $90 million, but it would phase out slowly and it's lost revenue that can be made up in hopefully in other areas or 
budget cuts, one or the other. So that's the bill we're hoping to move forward. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, as uh, you were saying, I mean, whether it's the farm or the small business, I don't think people realize how many folks are uh, affected by it, by yeah. this, you know, where mm -hmm. they may not have children, or maybe the children don't even want to be a part of it. Maybe the, uh, you know, niece or nephew or brother or mm -hmm. sister have been partnering with them. And, you know, like we say, they're uh, asset rich, but, uh, you know, the finances might not be there to pay that big tax bill. And, uh, Big decisions need to be made, and you know you see a, cons a consolidation of these small businesses or even farms, and that's the reason why is people can't afford it. So we really appreciate your leadership on uh, that issue in the House, and uh, I know you'll be working with uh, the Senate, and we'll be talking with Dan Dawson, who's the Ways and Means chairs in the Senate later on today. Uh, but I know you guys are working together to get that phased out, and that'll be huge for. Uh, Iowa and both of our members and uh, small business. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, you know, here's another big tax issue that people uh, worry about, and I, I consider you an expert on this. Uh, you know, property taxes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a huge problem. It's not going to, we're not going to fix it overnight. Uh, we all know we have high property taxes here, and that affects obviously our small business folks, especially mm -hmm. if they own their own small towns uh, shop or whatnot. But, uh, you know, as not only you were a local official, but now you're obviously a representative, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the things you all have done over the last couple of years to get started on the right path to maybe permanently fixing uh, our property tax problem? Oh, <laughs> that's a lot in one breath. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll take, you know, just yeah. give us your thoughts. On, you know, our, our property taxes are high. Um, and I think most people are are okay with some point of property taxes when you're getting yeah. something for your property taxes, uh, but we just keep putting more and more things on property taxes. Uh, mental health is the first thing that comes to mind. Yep. It's not a property tax issue. It shouldn't be on property taxes, I don't think. Um, we did have a bill a couple of years ago. We tried to introduce a little more transparency and make you know people in your community aware of any increase more than 2%. And people just didn't seem very interested. We published it again and again, trying to say, you need to tell people why you're raising taxes. And what I found in my hometown and most the area that I've seen is it's easier to kind of complain about it. They go <laughs> in and, and fight about it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times there's a good reason to raise property taxes. There's a project or there's other employees, raises, whatever, whatever it might be. But a lot of times there's not a good reason. And I think we need to really stop and look at what we're spending our money on. If, if nothing else, there's oftentimes a disconnect between what the local government is gonna use the money for and the people's understanding. And mm -hmm. So hopefully we can bridge that. Mm -hmm. The last question we wanna ask you about today, and especially since you represent, as you said, I think four counties uh, that, that border Minnesota, mm -hmm. is the idea of, look, we're in a competitive national economy and states are kind of competing against each other. So in your opinion, mm -hmm. What could Iowa do to make uh, make us a more attractive place for families and businesses to come here so they end up on the right side of that maybe uh, Minnesota and mm -hmm. Iowa border? Um, well, I'll give our governor credit this year. I think she did a great job. We had a lot of Minnesota people down because of the masks, and that was a big deal. But that's a one-year thing, so it won't go there. Um, I think, you know, keeping our taxes in line, both property taxes and income taxes and sales tax, all three have to be lined up. and. Sales tax, it's you know what we tax, not just the, the rate. Um, you know, Minnesota property taxes, I think, are quite a bit higher than, than Iowa's. Uh, their income tax seems to be pretty close. Um, I do a lot of tax returns both across state lines, so they do seem to be pretty close there. Um, just keeping our tax rates down. Um, some of our income tax gets a little tricky. They talk about our eight and nine percent tax well, the effective rate isn't that, but because we have very little conformity with the federal government, it can look like a different number than it really is. And I think we're, we're working towards conformity and making a simpler tax system, which will give us a truer picture of the rate we're paying. So I think that's a good start. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I think people make decisions on uh, those sorts of things right especially we've seen in covid you know where you go and live where it's a little more free where our kids can go to school yeah. and things like yeah. like that but i mean taxes are, are a big deal especially income tax you know if you can 
you know, move from California and get an instant 10% raise yeah. by moving to say here or another state or, you know, like South Dakota obviously has no income tax. I mean, that, people make decisions based on that and, you know, how much money and what they can provide for their family. So you're right uh, that, uh, you know, the best way to, to get people here is have a good tax, uh, tax policies and, uh, uh, you know, do things that will get people here that are business friendly and so we just really appreciate uh your time here today uh you know we're going to jump now to a former colleague of yours who, who has a message for our members she was working side by side with you uh last year but now she's in the great halls of washington dc yeah. and uh really fighting uh uh some tough battles and so uh it's uh, my pleasure now to hand it over to one of your former colleagues congresswoman ashley henson Hi everyone, I wish I could be with all of you in person, but I'm excited to at least be able to give you a virtual update on my work here in Washington, DC. The small business community is truly the backbone of the American economy and certainly of Iowa's economy. I am so grateful for everything that you all do to keep Iowans employed and grow our economy, especially after facing so many hardships this past year. That's also why I'm so passionate about fighting for common sense policies in Congress that will help small businesses and jumpstart our economy so our country can get back on the right track. I've been fighting hard against a federal $15 minimum wage mandate. I got real world feedback from Iowa small businesses about how this would devastate their businesses, forcing them to cut hours, pay, or even close their doors for good. I fought against this being included in the House version of the spending bill that passed last week. I'm hopeful that the final legislation will not include this job killing provision that would harm Iowans, especially those in rural communities. I've also been hearing a lot from small business owners and families who are worried about potential tax increases. Rest assured, I will fight against any tax increase that would make life harder for Iowans who have already faced enough challenges over the past year. The federal government needs to make it easier for people to save money and to get back on their feet. And that is exactly what I am focused on here in Washington. I've also been leading the charge in Congress to help reopen our schools and get kids and students back in the classroom safely. Our kids are falling behind academically and children across this country are facing a mental health crisis. This is personal to me as a mom and it's personal to every parent who has become a de facto homeschool teacher over the past year. Thankfully, Iowa has been leading the way on this issue and we have the option to send our kids to learn in person. This means working parents like me, and I'm sure many of you, are able to send your kids to school and go to work each day. This is an economic issue as well as an educational one, and I'm going to keep working to reopen schools safely across the country. So thank you so much for this opportunity to provide you with an update on my work here in Washington, DC. I look forward to giving you another update soon, and please contact our office if we can be helpful on anything you need help with. Thank you so much. It's an honor to serve you in Congress. Thank you, Congresswoman Hinson, for that update from Washington. Uh, while we miss you in Iowa, we're so glad you're in D.C. Uh, representing Iowans there. Our next guest today is Senator Dan Dawson uh, from Council Bluffs. Senator Dawson, why don't you introduce yourself to our members? Appreciate it. Dan Dawson, I represent Senate District 8 in Council Bluffs, which is all of Carter Lake and about two thirds of Council Bluffs, to be more accurate. This is starting my second term in the Iowa Senate where I've been newly appointed to the Senate Ways and Means Committee, uh, which to be uh, a little bit braggadocious is probably the best committee in the entire Capitol there. So I decided to do it and uh, decided to do some great things. Yeah, Senator, uh, that is awesome. You uh, take over the reins on taxes uh, in the Senate. Uh, you know, you guys have uh, lifted mountains over the last uh, few years on taxes here in Iowa. We know we're ranked uh, one of the worst states for taxes, but you've chipped away and it's a multi-year project and uh you know again another year we've had a big red wave in iowa and i think it's the voters saying hey keep doing what you're doing and so again uh after the pandemic and the ppp uh stuff our folks are looking to keep uh, some of their own hard-earned uh, money including their employees and so uh, taxes is at the forefront again this year and i know you guys are working on uh, maybe phasing out inheritance tax 
uh, eliminating those triggers from the 18 tax cuts so that we ensure that those tax breaks actually happen. Uh, and then uh, addressing uh, property tax by really first getting rid of stuff that shouldn't be on property tax. So why don't you just give our audience members a, a little preview of uh, what you're thinking, what your caucus is working on, uh, your vision, and uh, I think a bill maybe or a set of bills may be dropping here soon. So yeah, the floor is yours. No, absolutely. Uh, and first, let me say that I've always viewed the role of our Senate Ways and Means Committee as an incubator for economic progress and ideas. Uh, that committee, our committee, is never going to stop doing that. We're going to look at a variety of things uh, to continue that role. Uh, Looking at Iowa, I think we've been very lucky in the pandemic in that we've always had responsible budgeting the last few years. We've still drawn down our tax liability, and we are in a great position compared to, quite frankly, most other states in the nation to continue forward. Uh, to borrow a line from President Biden uh, during the campaign, he always said, build back better. And that's what our Senate Ways and Means Committee is going to do, is not just use uh, money for the current crisis. And to be clear, there's businesses and families out there still hurting. But to build back better our tax code and how to make it more transformational, how to make it more competitive for the future. Uh, so that is going to be our charge going forward. Uh, what we've been working on the last few months, uh, as mentioned, we'll talk about some bills here in a minute and everything. But what we want to do is figure out how do we move beyond the pandemic and really put Iowa in pole position to be one of the leaders in the nation? You know, you look at other states, just uh, today I was reading an article here on the way in this morning, uh, West Virginia, they got a very robust uh, property or income tax rollback uh, plan they're gonna roll out pretty soon. If we're not thinking forward, we're going back. And our Ways and Means Committee is always gonna be thinking forward uh, to propel our state. So some of the things I'm thinking about this year and we are working on this year, uh, first and foremost from the Senate standpoint, is eliminating the triggers. Uh, I have never liked those triggers to begin with in the first place. You know, uh, it's based upon a revenue target and a growth target. And while those might be uh, logical in a bubble, uh, once we go outside the bubble, we have to realize that businesses need some predictability out there. And we could hit our revenue target in FY23 or FY24, but even if we hit that revenue target, if we're below on the growth, then we're kicking the can down the road another year. So when businesses are paying forward on their taxes, what predictability do they have? And my uh, motto has always been to make government work for the taxpayers and not taxpayers work for the government. And by saying that, or by doing that, uh, we need to get rid of those triggers because the government needs to work for taxpayers. Taxpayers need predictability, whether it be small businesses, whether it be individuals. So getting rid of those, locking those in, and giving everyone predictability of what their income tax liability is going to be uh, is one of our top priorities. As well, uh, finding creative ways to go forward and drive down our tax rate, not just getting rid of those triggers, but further and make our code more competitive. The, the governor had her invest in Iowa plan last year that was put on hold this year because of the pandemic but i can tell you that we are actively uh, trying to build towards a more robust plan to come back in the next general assembly and figure out ways to modernize our income tax personal and corporate as well as our sales tax uh, those things are at the forefront of my mind as well as uh, you know within her bill one of the things that she had was to property tax relief and take mental health funding uh, off property taxes that is something that I think we can work on this year. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about in the next few weeks as the Senate rolls out a plan to finally uh, move mental health off of property taxes, find a more sustainable funding mechanism for it growing forward, uh, for it to grow going forward and provide Iowans tax relief. You know, one of the things we saw during the pandemic this last year is that we had a very robust housing market. Yeah. And one of the things at the forefront of my brain uh, throughout that robust housing market is eventually these assessors are going to start rolling in and reappraising these houses. And if this levy remains the same, we could quite possibly be pricing some people out of their houses that by virtue of a hot housing market, uh, you know, otherwise it's no fault of their own. Yep. So property tax relief is going to be our big focuses this year as well, too. So Hey, that's great. And I know uh, in talking to Jane uh, just a few minutes ago, 
uh, she talked about uh, the importance of getting rid of uh, the inheritance tax. She had a personal story of a niece who passed away, and then uh, the folks that inherited this land had a $160,000 bill. And so I know you're working with her and those folks on the House side to maybe uh, phase that out over a two, three year period, which our, our members would uh, love to see because it just doesn't affect farms. And, it, you know, think of the dry cleaner who uh, the cousin runs the business because the kids are somewhere else in, in the country and they can't afford the tax bill when the time comes when they inherit that. So uh, you want to maybe talk about yeah. that as well? And I should mention that earlier on here. That's yeah. one of my, uh, we have enough ideas in the call during the Senate. Yeah. You kind of misplace uh, them once in a while. Uh, that is a Senate priority as well, too. We actually had a, uh, we ran a subcommittee here earlier on this year. Uh, I believe there's going to be some more movement on that very quickly. But my bottom line when it comes to inheritance tax is that we are one of six states left that actually have it. And, uh, you know, times change, the way you view things change as times go on. But if you look at the inheritance tax section of the code, it's over 20 pages of how to tax someone's assets after they die. Some are exempt, some aren't, some have different uh, rates of taxation. And to me, the entire argument is a morbid argument. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, when someone passes away in the end, uh, what they would choose to do with what they've worked to accumulate their entire life, if they want to give it to a church, if they want to give it to a family member, whether it be a brother, a kid, so on and so forth, uh, that's between them and those individuals. And I don't see any compelling interest the government has to actually get involved in someone's estate after they die just to take a portion of it because the government has some title to it. It's a morbid argument, uh, or it's a morbid policy to begin with, and uh, the Iowa Senate uh, will be moving forward on trying to eliminate that inheritance tax. That's fantastic. Chris? You know, Representative Bloomingdale was in here a few minutes ago, and she, of course, represents a number of counties on the Minnesota border. So she understands what this uh, competitive economy is like. You, uh, of course, look right across the river to, to Omaha and uh, the state of Nebraska. So from that perspective, can you talk about some things Iowa could do or should be doing to remain competitive? Again, so we draw families, so we draw businesses, so we draw workers, um, because we're competing um, with the entire country for these things. Right. Uh, you know, on a border community, we count some blessed in Carver Lake looking over to Omaha. Uh, there's a variety of things that we have working against us. Iowa has a higher property tax rate than over in Omaha. Uh, Iowa has a higher income tax rate than over. You know, uh, our income tax rate right now is about 8.4%. Nebraska is a 67 uh, The only uh, thing that we really have, I shouldn't say the only thing, one of the things we have going for us is a sales tax rate, which is slightly lower, but only by about a half a percent. When a business comes in and they're gonna look between Council Bluffs and Omaha, where they're gonna locate, they need to know what their tax liability is up front. And if they can't understand that tax liability within the first 40 seconds of the conversation, we lose the business. And that's the problem with the Iowa code is that we have high rates, art, you know, a bunch of carve outs, exceptions, so on and so forth. And it's too confusing for businesses. So one of the best things that we can do for all Iowans and businesses is streamline our code, get rid of these carve outs, get rid of some of these exemptions, draw these rates down, and actually put it on the bottom line up front on a piece of paper. If you locate your business in Carver Lake, Council Bluffs, or anywhere in Iowa, this is what your tax liability is gonna be. That's where we should be going forward with this discussion as opposed to trying to compensate for one issue here and one issue there. Holistic transformational tax reform. Yeah, I like it. Before we let you get back to the Capitol to uh, lead on a lot of these good policies, what else would you like to tell our members today? What I like to, the message I want to relay to the members there is first and foremost, thank you for what you do. Uh, as I've said time and time again, the business owners, the small business owners are on the forefront of providing jobs, opportunity, and economic development for our communities across the state. I think a lot of times our business owners aren't thanked enough for what they do. You know, they go, they wake up every day, they figure out how to keep the lights on, how to keep employees employed, and how to deliver a product and how to make that product better. Uh, there are individuals who go out to their communities at the end of the day, and they might sponsor a soccer team or they might help out a booster club. Uh, our business owners, the small business owners, are the backbone of this state here. And I don't think a lot of times that they're thanked enough for what they do, as opposed to they are uh, accosted when they just want to keep more of their own personal money in their pockets. So the message I want to relate to NFIB members today is thank you for what you're doing. 
uh, you, your sacrifices are not forgotten in the Iowa legislature and the tax policy, the Senate Republicans are to deliver respect and honor uh, the effort you put forward every day. But That's a tax cool. policy makes sense for both of our organizations, so we, we appreciate that. And now we're going to hear from one of your former colleagues, uh, then Senator Feenstra, now Congressman Feenstra, uh, one of Iowa's newest uh, legislators in Washington, D.C., is going to provide an update from his perspective in Washington. Hi, everyone. Randy Feenstra here. Wish we could all be together in person, but I wanted to take a couple of minutes to provide a quick update from Washington. But first, I want to thank both the Iowans for Tax Relief and the National Federation of Independent Businesses for the important work you're doing in Iowa to fight for taxpayers and small businesses, which formed the backbone of our wonderful economy. As you know, I previously, previously chaired the Ways and Means Committee in the Iowa Senate. Tax policy is a passion of mine, and as a former businessman, I know firsthand how the negative impacts of high taxes can have it on Main Street businesses and working families. That's why I authored and passed the largest income tax cut in Iowa history. Now that I'm in Congress, I will continue to support policies that allow Iowans to keep more of their hard-earned money. That includes fighting against any attempt to raise taxes. On the campaign trail, President Biden repeatedly named repealing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as one of his top priorities. Thankfully, that has not come to the House floor yet, but if it does, I will be an outspoken critic of this effort, and of course vote no. Overall, it has been a very busy couple of months in Congress. I am pleased to serve on three committees, the Agricultural Committee, Budget Committee, Science and Space and Technology Committee, and I've wasted no time getting to work. I have advocated against a $2 trillion COVID spending bill that only 9% of it went to COVID. This is a shameless bill where we as Iowans are responsible of how we spend our money. And yet they want to take our tax dollars and give them to New York and Illinois and California, where they were irresponsible with their taxpayer money. And that money would help bail them out. That's what the $2 trillion bill was all about. So, we voted against that. I will continue to work any way I can across the aisle to make sure I deliver results for Iowans. I've also joined the House Biofuels Caucus and the Rural Broadband Caucus, both bipartisan groups that work towards solutions in these areas. These are so important to Iowa and the 4th District. Again, before I close, I want to say thank you for all the important work you're doing for Iowa. Also, I please don't ever hesitate to contact my office with any questions, concerns, ideas, or comments that you have. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of the event. Well, it's good to hear from now Congressman Feenstra. Uh, again, can't tell you how excited we are to have Congresswoman Hinson and Congressman Feenstra representing Iowa in DC, and that's just a, a really good thing to have. Uh, we're pleased now to be joined by the House Majority Leader, Representative Matt Winschittle. Uh, could you introduce yourself uh, to the audience, tell them a little bit about your district and uh, maybe some of the committees you served on before uh, being in a leadership role you're in now? Sure. Uh, Matt Winschittle from uh, House District 17 out in Western Iowa, uh, the western half of Harrison, all of Monona, uh, all of Ida County and the southeast portion of Woodbury County. Uh, I've been elected office. This is my 15th session now. Um, I started at a relatively young man. I was elected at 22, uh, sworn in when I was 23. Um, during my time in the, the state house, I have served on a bunch of different committees, but primarily Ways and Means, uh, Judiciary, Public Safety, and a few other committees here and there over the years. Um, I focused uh, predominantly on freedom. Uh, the lens that I try and view everything through as we move legislation is how does this restore Iowa's freedoms? How does this give them more individual responsibility? And uh, how does this get government off of their back and let them make decisions for themselves? So that's just a little bit about me. Uh, but now as I serve as the majority leader, um, it's uh, quite a different role than the previous leadership positions that I've held, uh, but it is an honor to serve my caucus and to serve Iowans in this capacity. That's great. Uh, you know, you talk about freedoms and that, and uh, I was in just a great position, you know, coming out of this pandemic, I mean, Anytime I talk to folks or the media or things like that, I just give you guys so much credit 
uh, for setting us up so well. You know, there's 49 other Mies right. around the uh, around the country, and we are really set up. And that really starts, you know, obviously the governor kept things mostly open, uh, but you guys over the last several years have had, uh, you know, great budgetary uh, restraints. And uh, you can see it, you know, all of our funds are full, you know, uh, and our budgets are balanced where most states aren't. And I think that's going to not only not only helped us in the last year, but will help us get out of that. Do you want to sort of talk about, you know, the principles of a conservative uh, budget? I mean, I think that is key. Well, if you want to toss me that softball, I'll be happy to get that part. Um, Back in 2011, when Republicans first took the majority in the state house, uh, we had some very basic budgeting principles, and we've held true to those uh, all the way throughout the past 10, now going on 11 years being in the majority. And those are we don't spend money uh, that we don't have. Uh, we make sure that uh, we're not using one time expenditures on ongoing uh, expenses, uh, and that we also are at every opportunity trying to find ways to return taxpayer dollars back into their pocket. Um, oftentimes, when you get into debate on anything that deals with uh, the state general fund, You'll hear legislators from the more liberal side of things talk about state money or government money. No, it's the taxpayer's money. And so when we don't need it for the ongoing expenses that we have, we've been trying to uh, return that to Iowans because you make better decisions with your money than what government does. Uh, And that's held true. And that's why we're in the position that we're in. We've held the line on uh, those budgeting principles for over a decade now. Uh, It's put us in the position that we are, especially coming out of this pandemic. And uh, I'm proud of what House Republicans have done. And once we got the Senate a few years back, uh, it made it much easier to continue pushing those principles forward when we didn't have to negotiate with a Democrat Senate. So we're going to continue to do that this year and moving forward. Excellent. Yeah, that's good to hear. I'm not sure Matt or I could have said that any better ourselves. So uh, way to go on that. One of our uh, one of our members, Cindy in Cedar Rapids, wrote in, and, and their business, frankly, is back to where they were pre-pandemic, and they're now into this workforce issue. And uh, her comments are, she's having a hard time finding skilled and unskilled labor. Right. She needs people to work, and and I want to kind of piggyback off of that uh, comment from Cindy and and talk about the license reforms. Uh, Last year, you all passed a really good bill that recognized licensure from out of state. Uh, There were some fee waivers for folks of certain income levels, and you even made it easier for folks with a conviction history to to move ahead. And and this year, uh, you're considering additional licensing reforms. And they just sort of open-ended to you, why are licensing reforms important? Why, why 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 is the legislature in the Iowa House specifically moving ahead with these licensing reforms? Well, I think it's important to come back to those base fundamental principles of freedom and individual responsibility. Um, We looked at the governor's licensing reform bill uh, the last year and wanted to get that done because we want to cut that burdensome red tape. We want to make sure that people that are out there that are looking for a good career and a good profession can do that and be able to function in society without having to jump through one bureaucratic hoop after another. Um, So that's why we've done the bill that we've done previously. We're looking at more reforms this year. Uh, And one of the other things that ties in with that is due to the pandemic and a lot of the regulatory restrictions that were lifted to try and ease the burden on local businesses and small businesses, um, I'm happy to say that some of those bells can't be unrung. And we've seen efficiencies within that that we are looking at and trying to put forward in legislation to make sure that we don't have those same type of regulatory restrictions. Now granted, there's always a time and place for some regulation to make sure that you have good actors doing the right thing. But at the same time, some of that bureaucratic red tape gets pretty thick. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, House Republicans have proven that we like to take a big old ax to some of that red tape <laughs> and let Iowans make the decisions for themselves. So uh, we're proud to have done what we've done and we're gonna continue to make progress moving forward. That's great. Uh, another issue, and this is from Barb uh, and Pella, you know, I, I think we saw during the pandemic and then the governor's introduced to Bill how important broadband is, right. uh, especially to our rural folks. And uh, I guess her question, is you know how does uh, the broadband bill and the ICN and the small independent telephone companies how does that all work and I know you guys are kind of in the nuts and bolts on the broadband and coming up with a good good plan but broadband is going to be important too to connect uh, you know our uh, rural areas and I know you guys are leading the way on on that as well do you want to just touch on uh, your thoughts oh absolutely yeah. I again applaud Governor Reynolds for uh, taking on some bold initiatives including broadband throwing some proposals out there, putting her weight uh, in her office behind, uh, trying to get expanded access out there. Again, the pandemic has taught us many things. Uh, One of them is that we're looking at businesses now that have a lot of people that are telecommuting. And when you get to rural Iowa, which I represent and uh, the majority of my caucus represents, uh, it is important that those people have access to high-speed internet. 
Um, you know, we knew it was going to be important coming into this session. Uh, we recognized that even before the first gavel fell. That's why the Speaker of the House chose to establish a new committee, Information and Technology Committee, so we could address these issues specifically and dig down to the nuts and bolts. And there are a lot of different players out there with your different uh, internet providers, media providers, things like that. We're working through the different nuances to it, and then we're also trying to establish uh, how much funding we can really put into that. The governor's asked for $450 million over the next three years. Um, it's doable, but we also want to make sure that that is the best investment with whatever policies we put in place. So it goes hand in glove with making sure that we are establishing the right standards and right metrics to say, here's what our expectation is for the taxpayer's investment and making sure that it's not just looked at as an investment, but also looked at as we are purchasing something for Iowans that they are going to be able to use for their own benefit and continue to grow our economy and grow our small businesses. Exactly what our business is called, ROI. Right, return <laughs> on investment. Yeah. Sometimes we think of our state legislature as the last line of defense uh, based on what uh, something crazy Washington, D.C. might throw at us. And right now in D.C., they're considering a bill that's got a lot of uh, publicity in the House, H.R. 1. Mm -hmm. H.R. 1 does a lot of things. Maybe the most direct thing we do to an organization like Islands for Tax Relief or NFIB uh, is it would force disclosure of our uh, donor base. It would remove the privacy of members to support organizations like ours and other charities. Uh, and, and the unfortunate consequence of that is in other states, and government has weaponized that. I don't think it's a stretch to say we're kind of polarized. Uh, people see somebody who disagrees with them as a political enemy, and, and, and sometimes they use that. Credit, uh, again, to the Iowa House uh, for passing um, a donor privacy bill uh, earlier this year. Uh, the Senate has, has advanced it as well. Can you talk a little about your thoughts on uh, passing what we believe is a really important piece of legislation here in Iowa? Sure. This is something that we had actually entertained in the last legislative session. Um, unfortunately, there were some poison pills filed by the Democrats. And at that point in time, uh, it, we weren't able to get it across the finish line. Uh, however, uh, as we move forward this year, we recognize how important that really can be to those people that are out there just trying to do the right thing, be charitable, uh, give their donations without being hounded by either the government or have other people come knocking on the door being like, hey, I know you gave a check to so-and-so, can you give me a check too? Because routinely politicians will go data mine somebody else's information to go find a new donor base. Um, guilty. Uh, so we know that that's important uh, for those people, but also for those, those organizations. And uh, I'm happy that we were able to get it through the House and uh, looking forward to the Senate sending it down to the governor. I think one, one last question, uh, and then we'll end it. You know, obviously our members, uh, they love talking taxes, and you guys have done unbelievable stuff over the last three, four years as you've had the trifecta to keep lowering taxes, whether it's property or income taxes, uh, things like that, even the inheritance taxes maybe on the calendar this year. You know, we had Jane in here earlier and she wants to work on that and Dan Dawson, I think, okay. uh, was in here and, and, and talked about that. Do you just want to briefly touch, you know, uh, on the importance of continuing each year to do something on taxes as we have this trifecta? Well, I'll go back to my opening statement. We're always looking for the opportunity yeah. to return the taxpayers' dollars back to them so they can make the investment uh, where they see fit. Um, and it's going to be complicated as always because it always comes down to the budget. How do you score how much money you're going to put into either tax credits or reducing taxes, whether property or income? Uh, you get in the mix of a lot of the agricultural community out there uh, wants to see their property taxes burden lowered, uh, especially when it comes to mental health assessments, yep. right? Uh, so we have that entire ball of wax and we're looking at every different facet of it, trying to determine what is feasible um, monetarily with the state budget um, and making sure that we can, can still continue to fulfill the commitments that we have. Uh, but right now, as you talked about in your opening, I was, I was in a great place financially. Yeah. We've got all of our coffers full. Uh, we've got an ending balance. We're looking at uh, continued projected growth. Uh, we'll see what the March REC Revenue Estimating Conference uh, predicts for the next quarter. Um, and we're going to try and find new ways to cut taxes. Now, I know Senator Dawson's got, I think his bill is out public now. Yep. Uh, at least that's what I was told yesterday. Uh, some great ideas in there. Um, there is a lot of back and forth on whether we uh, reduce the triggers or cut the triggers that we established in our previous income tax bill. Uh, that's part of the discussion. I think one way or the other, we're going to hit those triggers anyway. So mm -hmm. I, it, to me, it's almost a moot point. Um, but if we can accelerate those and get those uh, tax cuts in sooner, um, we're exploring those options and we're going to see where we can get to. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, businesses love predictability. Right, and, right. Uh, that is uh, great. And we just appreciate, you know, I know you guys have 
led the way uh, over the last few years on, on correcting uh, years and years of bad tax policy. So uh, we encourage and thank you for continuing uh, those those efforts. So well, there's more work to be done. Yep, there's no there's question always about work it. to be done. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. We appreciate the good work you're doing uh, up the hill. And uh, as you say, just keep keep going. There's always more work to be done. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. I tax relief and NFIB, everything that uh, you and your members do for House Republicans, but for Iowans in general, and keeping us on the right path. So uh, if I could say anything uh, to the membership out there, keep our feet to the fire. Keep us honest and keep us responsible. We need your phone calls. We need you to uh, contact your area representatives and make sure that they're doing the right thing for you to grow our economy and grow your businesses. So thank you. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everybody uh, for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying the program so far and thanks to the thousands of business owners uh, like you. NFIB has the clout to make a difference at both the state and federal levels on important small business issues like those we have discussed today. There's nothing more frustrating than seeing your business stifled by high taxes, obstructive regulations, or harmful court decisions. That's why NFIB maintains dedicated teams in Washington, D.C. and all 50 state capitals to make sure the voice of small business is always heard. Our success is based on strength in numbers. Each new NFIB member makes our voice that much stronger uh, and makes our efforts to fight anti-small business legislation that much more powerful. This is especially true when we need to take a bit on big business groups, big labor, and other well-funded interest groups that are pushing an agenda that is really harmful to small business. If you are a non-member uh, who has joined us today, or you know of other businesses or colleagues uh, who need their voices to be amplified, we welcome you to send us their contact information, or you can tell them to email or call me uh, at our state office right here in Des Moines uh, my email is matt.everson, E-V-E-R-S-O-N, at nfib.org, or call our main line at 515-243-4723. They can also call 1-800-NFIB-NOW to reach our national member care team, or visit nfib.com. It's a great resource uh, and website with a lot of information. Uh, thanks again. Now back to the program. Welcome back to uh, our virtual studio. We uh, obviously have another guest with us, uh, the new Senate president, uh, Jake Chapman. Uh, he's been a rock star for NFIB and ITR uh, for years now, uh, passing uh, monumental legislation uh, that is important to both of our memberships. And so I just wanna throw it over to uh, the Senate president. Why don't you uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your district, and uh, then we'll get into some questions. No, thank you, Matt. Uh, Jake Chapman from Adel. I represent the 10th Senate District. It encompasses a portion of uh, Polk County, Polk City, a good part of Dallas County, Adair, Guthrie, and part of Cass County. And uh, like you, I'm a small business owner. We have uh, a couple of businesses that we run and operate, and uh, just very grateful for what NFIB and ITR does for Iowans, uh, for the tremendous support you give us up at the Capitol uh, to, to pass meaningful legislation that uh, really benefits our small business owners and the taxpayers of Iowa. So thank you to, to these two outstanding organizations. Well, we're glad to have uh, senators who are receptive to the issues that are important to our members. So uh, thank you. Um, but along those lines, Senator Dawson was in here earlier, uh, the Senate Ways and Means Chair, and he talked about uh, one of his priorities being eliminating those triggers from the 2018 uh, income tax reforms, cementing those changes in, in place, and finally delivering everything that was passed back in 2018. Um, we had a, we had a uh, member submit a question that was simply just income taxes, what's next? Um, so I guess it, we'll, just, we'll just ask that simple question. Yeah. Uh, once, we, once we get those 18 changes into place, What's next? What's the big picture where we, where we should go in this state on the income tax front? Well, I'll just say Senator Dawson has a tremendous job to do. I was chair of Ways and Means last year, and uh, it's not an easy job, but uh, I was really excited when the, the governor, during her State of the State address, uh, talked about eliminating the triggers, and I think she even said they're unnecessary, and I couldn't agree more. They are unnecessary triggers at this point uh, in the game, and so we've got to at least get get that done, but I think we need to look much, much broader than that. 
Um, the reality is even with those tax cuts, uh, removing those triggers, getting us from 8.98 down to six and a half, we're still a very high income tax state uh, when you compare us to other states in the Midwest. And so uh, my goal is the total elimination of income tax. Uh, I believe it was Mississippi, Alabama, I believe it was Mississippi. Um, their governor is also pushing for a total elimination of income tax and we will lose a competitive um, uh, marketplace when we're not advancing and moving towards that total elimination. I just have to say, you know, when you go up to Northwest Iowa, mm -hmm. there is a migration that's occurring and uh, they're not going there for the sand dunes. You know, I know everyone <laughs> loves going to the beach, you go to Florida for the beaches. You're not going to South Dakota uh, for, the, for the sand. You're going there and they're going there because they have no income tax. They're gonna shield um, their income. And, uh, and so why don't we put something forward that's very bold and uh, uh, have a phase out approach towards a total elimination and keep our greatest resources here and that's our people. Um, why do we have to lose Iowans to South Dakota? Uh, they should be here. We should be able to attract other people. Uh, just like what you're seeing in South Dakota, uh, we can be that destination as well, particularly on our uh, east border, uh, our northern border, uh, all around us. And uh, so I think what's next is moving towards a total elimination of income tax. I think we're on board. Yeah, I, I think our group would uh, love uh, to see that. Obviously, you know, whether you're a business or, or you know, an employee, you know, people make decisions based on uh, economics. I mean, we've seen that over the last year with uh, uh, people struggling and living in either shut down states or high tax states. And this has given them an opportunity to relocate to places that uh, have less taxes and businesses are doing the same. And I think we would see a boom here in Iowa because we do. It's a great place to live, a great place to raise a family. And now if we can work to get some of those taxes down. Um, I do have a question here from a member that has popped up, Dennis from Glenwood. You know, he's first we're hit with uh, the floods out here, then COVID-19. Uh, and so 2020 was uh, uh, unbelievably uh, tough. You know, obviously they've gotten a lot of federal help, but what are some of the uh, things you guys are working on to help some of these folks that are, you know, still struggling, especially in the entertainment industry per se, uh, you know, that uh, have dealt with some of these blows? Yeah. Well, thank you, Dennis, for that question. And I'll, I'll say the very first thing that we needed to do and what we have done is opened our state back up. You got to stop the bleeding. Um, and so open the economy up, let businesses do what they do best, and that is uh, prosper economically through providing goods and services to the people of Iowa. And so that was very important. I'm very um, thankful for the governor for opening up our state and, and uh, we've weathered COVID so much better than other states uh, because, and by, uh, by and large, because we've kept Iowa open. And so that's number one, but, but number two, some of those things we can't control, right? You know, weather issues we can't control, but we can control the tax policy. And uh, you know, from the PPP loans, making sure that those are exempt from income tax in Iowa, that's a huge deal. That's an important issue yeah. that we need to make sure that um, these loans that are forgiven at the federal level, the purpose of them were to, to keep these businesses afloat. It's not right for us to, to then come in and say, hey, we're gonna tax tax these uh, loans as well. So um, those are a couple of things that I can think of right off the top of my head, but you know, workforce is going to continue to be an issue. Yeah. And uh, whether whether it's a derecho or whether it's um, COVID, whatever it may be, the one thing that's consistent in Iowa is we need more workforce. We need qualified workforce. And, uh, and so there's not a one bullet that's gonna solve all of those problems, but um, one thing after another, you know, it, it, tax policy, affordable housing, um, broadband connectivity. I, I support that because frankly, it's a, a great equalizer when it comes to rural Iowa uh, is being able to have that connectivity to do business from home. So I think the Republican party is putting forward a tremendous uh, uh, group of, of legislation to uh, draw in that workforce here into our state. Yeah, that's, uh, that's well said and uh, great. And uh, you know, we are, we're very fortunate 
our budgets are all balanced and we are in great shape to come out of this. And, you know, NFIB just had their jobs report last week and some of the issues that were pre-pandemic, which is finding qualified workforce, is becoming a big issue again. And so right. that's good news as our economy begins to come out of this. And you really sort of answered Lynn from Arnold Park's uh, question where, you know, we know at the federal level, uh, PPP is exempt and deductible. Uh, you know, are you guys working to make sure that you know, is done here in Iowa, and I think you've answered that. Right. And, and yes, I know there's a technical fix bill out there that would include some 2019 filers, but uh, you guys have been on the forefront of making sure right. you are. And why don't you talk a little bit about what you did really in June to make sure that happened? All right. So that was uh, that's something we did do back in June was made sure that the PPP loans were not going to be um, uh, counted as income. Uh, unfortunately, there's you have calendar filers and you have fiscal filers, and uh, and so we need to make sure we get that resolved for our fiscal uh, business owners. But um, let me just also add this, if I can, Matt. Yeah. Um, that I think what what is frustrating to me as a business owner is the fact that we continue to see federal level uh, incentivizing people to stay home. Uh, we need people to come back to work. And, uh, and when you see the incentives that is coming out of Washington, D.C. to, to uh, incentivize these people not to come back to work is really a, an unfortunate uh, circumstance because far too many are making more staying at home than just coming out and getting back to work. And that's what we need. We need people to get back to work. Yeah, in fact, when the first uh, PPP or relief fund, uh, legislation came out, we fought against that $600 right. uh, extra bonus per se, because we knew that most of the workers that would go out would be making more off unemployment and it would be really hard to restart the economy. And so, uh, you know, we can't go backwards on that. And I'm, right. I'm glad they're sort of lowering those thresholds because you're right, we're seeing now where there's work to be done. We need workers uh, and to make an economy go, you gotta have workers. Uh, uh, doing the work and right. producing and growing. So, yeah, we really appreciate your leadership on, on that, Chris. Yeah, I'll, I'll summarize a few questions that came in and it's not surprised that um, a lot of folks write about the same issue, but property taxes. Now we realize that uh, decisions on, on local spending are made at the local level, um, but people still are not pleased with the property tax bills and too many of them uh, are, are not happy with the direction they're going. Is there anything more that the state can or should do uh, to maybe rein in the growth of some of those property tax bills? Yes, we absolutely should. And uh, unfortunately, what we find today is we had a number of businesses uh, forcibly shut down for a period of time, yet they still have to pay property tax and uh, yet they're not able to, to generate revenue. And so um, that's one issue, but um, the, the more global issue is the rising cost of owning property in the state of Iowa, whether it's a business or even residential. Um, you know, it is a common theme that we hear as legislators that people are really upset with how much they're having to pay just to live in their home. Um, I see what our property tax bills are for our commercial properties. It's outrageous. Um, you know, and this is about government, local government, living within their means as well. But to be very frank, I'm not sure the issue of property tax and reining in property tax can ever really be addressed until we address school funding mm. and how school funding is going to be uh, addressed because that is the, by and large, the, the biggest part of your uh, property tax. And of course, we've, we've tried uh, and we have passed truth in taxation in which, uh, unfortunately, what we find is local governments will will uh, use their assessor to increase the valuation of the property so your uh, local elected officials don't have to raise property tax. They can simply say, we kept the tax levy the same or we might have lowered the tax levy rate. But the reality is because of increased valuation, they're bringing in a lot more money, a lot more money. And the, the net effect of that is increase in taxes. And so uh, we pass truth in taxation, requiring more transparency when that occurs, uh, that the taxpayer knows uh, you're not gonna fool anyone, you are raising property tax on us. So those are important pieces. We'll see how those continue to play out uh, over the years, but um, more needs to be done. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, you have a number of legislators that would really like to address the property tax issue.
That's great. I mean, uh, all those things are important. I think the third item, you know, that you and I always talk about that's the most egregious tax is the inheritance tax. You know, obviously we've seen in a bill uh, that was dropped earlier this week, uh, Dan Dawson's sort of initial tax bill, he phases out inheritance tax over three years, which I think, you know, as long as we get there, uh, you know, we've we heard from Jane earlier, she had a personal story and she's working on the house side. We all have stories, right, of either farm, but it's not just farm, it's businesses. You know, the dry cleaner that's uh, run by a cousin and then inherits the company and isn't a blood relative and so, you know, a direct uh, descendant and so they get a big tax bill uh, as, uh, you know, their uh, business is getting handed over to them and they can't afford and they have to sell and things like that. And so. How about your thoughts? On, I know your thoughts, but how about you tell our folks your thoughts on, uh, you know, our inheritance tax? I mean, we're one of only six states now to have right. it. Well, I have to correct you. It's not, uh, it is the inheritance tax, but I call it the plunder tax because we are plundering between 70, $90 million from the grave every year. And it's a horrible tax policy. In fact, we know it's a horrible tax policy because it's been revised several times yeah. to whittle that, you know, the, the descendants down of who's going to have to pay the tax. And so it's a horrible tax policy. Um, it, 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 uh, I can't think of a tax that has been implemented in the United States that has done more to damage small uh, family businesses, uh, family farm. Um, it, it has been very destructive. Uh, when you uh, when you look at the debt tax, so um, no pun intended, we should bury this tax once and for all. I love it. And anything else, really? Well, I think you're asking the wrong person if you want to ask me anything else. I'd ask you, uh, yeah. Senator, anything else. What else does Iowa need to do? We, we've talked tax climate a lot, and, and that's really, really important, especially to members of both organizations. What else do we need to do as a state to, to keep moving ahead, keep drawing those families and those businesses here? Yeah, the most important thing we can do as government is get out of the way. Uh, let business do what they do best. And, um, you know, we just, unfortunately, oftentimes we get in the way of that, whether it's um, regulatory requirements or um, licensing requirements, whatever it may be, we just need to get out of the way and let business do what they do best, let Iowans do what they do best, and that is a grow an incredible economy. I mean, you look how resilient we are, what we've done uh, despite derecho, despite yeah. COVID. Um, can you imagine what our economy could do with, with no income tax and government just getting out of the way and letting business thrive? I mean, we, we would definitely be on the uh, map for a long time. And uh, so that's the one thing I would say is we need to get out of the way. Isn't it amazing? We sort of saw that in some states during this pandemic over the last year. You know, we put a lot of regulations on pause. You know, we exempted a lot of businesses, you know, whether you could deliver this or that. And, and it's amazing, you know, I mean, that's really what got us through. And I think if we did that while our economy is fully up and operational, how prosperous we could be. So spot on. Uh, spot on. Uh, anything else for the good of the order? Uh, what can we expect uh, the rest of the way, I guess, for this session? And I guess maybe how are you enjoying your new role as no, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely enjoying it. Yeah. Um, you know, every session takes on a life of its own. Um, you know, we have been given an incredible opportunity by Iowans to govern uh, with Republicans in control of the House, the Senate, and the governor. And they uh, rewarded us again this last fall. Um, and quite frankly, I think it wasn't just a referendum, but a mandate to push forward, to push a, a, a bold policy forward. Uh, the issues we've talked about, these are issues that, uh, frankly, other states only dream of. Yeah. And and here we are having real conversations about it. Um, and, and so uh, how the rest of the session goes, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but uh, I look forward to, to uh, making sure we have a good fiscal house in order, our yep. fiscal house in order, and uh, some, some of these really good policies, get those passed and uh, let Iowans, again, do what they do best and go back to work. Well, that's great. Uh, Senator, uh, your words uh, are meaningful to our members and I think ITR's uh, members and really now you guys are the last line of defense. I think what people are saying, I think our members are really nervous about DC and shoot, we're only 45 days or so into this thing and uh, there's already some huge ramifications for our small businesses uh, happening in D.C. So it's good to see a, a group of folks that are on our side of the taxpayer 
uh, with ITR and small business. So appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the year. Thank you. Before we wrap up today and send everyone on their way, we wanted to let you know that we plan on resuming our legislative roundtables in communities across the state. So if you'd be interested in helping us host an event in your town, let Matter I know, and we'd be happy to set something up for later this summer and fall. Thanks. Well, that's uh, the show for this year. Uh, unfortunately, it was virtual, but we hope you enjoyed the program and next year we'll get back uh, hopefully nor to normal in, in person. Uh, one quick reminder, uh, everybody out there, especially NFIB member and I think ITR member, you'll, you're gonna get an alert uh, to email your legislators about eliminating uh, the tax triggers. Uh, so we encourage you to click into that and uh, uh, send them an email on the importance of uh, eliminating those and getting our tax rates uh, down any lower. We wanna thank uh, all the legislators that joined us in our virtual studio today and uh, for the nice messages from uh, our uh, new leaders in DC, uh, Congressman Feenstra and uh, Congresswoman uh, Ashley Henson. And really wanna thank uh, ITR, who's just been a great partner for us uh, over the last few years on uh, anything we do on uh, taxes and defending the taxpayer, which obviously is important to all of our members. So really appreciate that partnership and looking forward to doing more stuff this summer and uh, next year. Yeah, back live and in person, right? Guaranteed. Back live and in person. As we just said, we are looking forward to getting out and doing legislative roundtables across the state. So again, please contact Matt or myself if you're interested in hosting. Uh, I would echo what Matt said about good legislation that's starting to move through the legislature. Uh, bills have been introduced that would both uh, eliminate the inheritance tax and get those uh, triggers eliminated as well and lock some future tax cuts into place. So in addition to opportunities for you to take action, please also be watching for uh, a number of stories of real Iowans who are impacted by the inheritance tax uh, in different ways. We'll be rolling those stories out as well, so keep your eyes open for them. And like Matt said, thanks a lot for joining us today.